Hello everyone, I'm Ellie Breakwell, APM Branches Coordinator, and thank you for joining us today at this APM Greater Bay Area Branch webinar. Please be aware this webinar is being recorded and you are in listen-only mode. There will be some interactive elements to today's webinar, so please have your phone or another web browser open and ready to go to menti.com and use the code 31104238. This will also be displayed on the screen with each question. Thank you again for joining us today. And with great, uh, with, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our host, the chair of the Greater Bay Area Branch, Jim Pippin. Over to you, Jim. Hi, thank you, Ali, and good day and welcome to this webinar. Before we be begin the presentation today, I'd like to announce the winners of the inaugural APM Greater Bay Area Branch Awards for 2022. And the Student of the Year Award goes to Elaine Pun for her project on the redevelopment of the Morrison Hill Swimming Pool and Institute of Vocational Education Campus. The winner of the Emerging, Emerging Professional Award goes to Ronan O'Byrne for his project on departmental-wide assessment on data architecture to formulate the long-term data strategy recommending approaches and roadmaps for future implementation of a departmental data and analytics platform. Uh, this again is our inaugural awards for the branch and we had some really good entries. I'd like to thank everybody who participated this year and again congratulations to our winners. The subject for our webinar today is smart risk management. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and you are in listen only mode. The session is going to last about 60 minutes with 40, 30 to 45 minutes of share, followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions in the questions panel during the webinar, and we'll address those at the end. Following the webinar, you can uh, the recording will be uploaded onto the APM YouTube account, and the slides will be published in the SlideShare account both of which will be listed on the branch community page and the APM website. Please allow us about a week to do this. This session also counts towards your CPD hours. Today, we are joined by Mr. Jimmy John, Principal Manager with CLP Holdings with almost 30 years of experience in project management, engineering, and o and including developing project risk management techniques for mega projects. Our other esteemed speaker is Mr. Joshua Lau, who has joined CLP Power as Head of Risk in 2021. Prior to CLP, Joshua was with our subsidiary Energy Australia for more than 20 years and held a variety of senior roles, including Head of Risk. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand you over to Jimmy and Joshua for the presentation. Gentlemen. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Jimmy Chung from Hong Kong, and Joshua from Australia is with me. We are from CLP. In today's webinar, we are going to share something that Joshua and I have recently done together on the project risk management. By sharing some of the lessons learned in the risk uplift program for the CLP's Hong Kong Mega Power Project, we would like to see how we can take smart risks in some aspects of the project management. The lessons that we are going to discuss today are not new to many of us. What we did is simply apply this modern risk management practice in our project in a systematic way. There are a fair bit of detail on how we execute each of those uplift initiatives. Given that there is only a limit of the time today, we will just touch on the service and won't be able to go in much details. We could drill down a bit more during the Q&A section um, for particular topics. To begin, uh, let's do something together to get your ideas on risk. On the screen now, you will see a QR code. Please scan it with your mobile phone and you will see the question, what is the most important factor for managing project risk effectively. Please choose an answer among four. If you think it is about the process, such as risk management framework, guidelines, please choose answer number one. Number two is culture. 
It's about people's attitude towards risk, whether linking risk management with daily project work and decision making. Number three is tools. For example, how to use a proper tool to identify risk and do risk analysis. Number four is the product governance. It's about the controls, oversight, and accountability. Let's wait for a minute for the result. Yeah, the result is coming. From the polling result, uh, we see most of us think that uh, culture, that means people, yeah, uh, is the most important for the project risk management. And quite many of us um, think about the tool and some think about the, uh, the governance, yeah, is important. In fact, uh, all these factors, process, culture, tools, governance are important to the product risk management, and we will cover them in today's webinar. Before we start, let me briefly introduce CLP, the company that Joshua and I work for. CLP has over a century history in power industry as an investor and operator. We have investments in Hong Kong, mainland China, Australia, India, Southeast Asia, and Taiwan. With recent projects include open and combined cycle gas turbine power units, renewable energy projects like solar panels, onshore and offshore wind farm, power grid transmission line projects, and battery storage projects. You see, CLP has different types of projects in different phases and across different regions. How we manage the projects determines how we can deliver the projects in a safe and effective manner. The CLP Group Project Management Governance System, in short, the PMGS, was first introduced in 2015 to provide the guidance and standardization on the project management and governance, uh, and governance across the regions for different types of projects. It also helps ensure a clear accountability and responsibility for all levels of the organization and at all stages of the project life cycle, from project development to execution and then to operation. The PMGS was further fine-tuned in 2018 after in implementing for some years. Let me pass the time to Joshua now. He will explain our project risk management update program. Thank you, Jimmy. The whole purpose of the update program is to, is to improve transparency and enhance project decision-making capabilities. Last year in 2021, we asked ourselves is there a better way to manage risk with our projects? And then we kick off the uplift program by referring to some of those modern risk management practice or ideas that has been developed around the world for the last 20 years or so. We, start, we study the risk management uplift success story with other organizations. And then to convert idea into practice, we adopt a test and learn approach and select with two pilot sites to roll out those initiatives. And then we fine-tune and adjust the application for CLP environments and roll out to other projects. At the very beginning of the program, first question in our mind was, what are the problems we are solving? We concluded that there were three aspects of the risk-taking activity that we must address for the uplift program. These three aspects are summarized as the why, the how and the what. The why referring to the attitudes of people think of risk. Often the perception of risk is a long list of bad things. Risk exposure must be reduced. There is a lot of fear of risk is not being reduced to its lowest level. In fact, risk is simply an uncertainty related to objective. Uncertainty itself is neutral. There is a lot of good risk that we must pursue in order to achieve a better outcome. So we set our focus on building a culture of good, taking good risks with confidence for our people. It helps the team to see a balanced view of risks that is seeing the threat and opportunity as the two sides of the same coin. 
on the how it referring to the relevancy of risk management and the whole decision making process. The focus was to revamp risk governance structure with a clear delegation and accountability. So when we introduce risk mitigation plan and control, they are relevant and proportional to the exposure that we are facing and with the right risk ownership. On the what or the know-how, these are referring to the skill set, tool set, and mechanism to make a better risk reward trade-off decision. So we have to develop a set of fit for purpose tool set and common language for people to use. Although this seems very basic, all of these three aspects play a significant role in the uplift of the maturity of the project risk management program. Now, if I go back to the post survey, it aligns very well on the view of the culture is important, so as the, the governance. As a side note, one particular thing is challenging is the common risk language. All of us came from different company and project background. We learn from the past about certain definition of risk terms. When we talk about a risk terms, it, it could refer to totally different things. For example, if I say residual risk, residual risk is defined as the amounts of risk that remain after control are accounted for. But what does it mean we account for the work in progress control or it referring to the risk exposure only when the control has been successfully implemented? So in order to reduce confusion, we start to use the term current risk current risk rating referring to the current status of the risk exposure, it does not account for those work in progress items. Now, for our uplift program, we have many different learning. Now, if we go to the next slide, we summarize those learning into five lessons. This page gives you an overview of what we are going to share in the next couple of um, minutes. Let me quickly run through them. Lesson one is about culture as the most important thing as uh, the survey. Um, so we are going to discuss the role of project risk management and its relationship with management as a whole. Lesson two is about the bow tie tools for project risk analysis. Lesson three is about the importance of risk appetite and target risk rating. Lesson four is about a practical way to enhance risk governance. Lesson five is about analyzing extreme risk event and how to be prepared for the unexpected. Pass you, so, Jimmy. Yeah, so what is risk management? From APM definition, we know that risk management is a process that allows individual risk events and overall risk to be understood and managed proactively, optimizing success by minimizing threats and maximizing opportunities and outcomes. What does that mean? It means that risk management happens at all stages of the project life cycle for any types of project. For example, during the project development phase, we have risks in defining the project strategy. In the execution phase, we have design and construction risks. Taking risks is actually a balancing act balancing the pros and cons to come up with the optimal decision. We may not realize it, but when we make a decision, our brain already goes through the process of analyzing the situation for pros and cons. If you bring decision making into managing projects, project risk management could come into play during day-to-day -day routine work, such as Assessing changes, assessing construction site risk, assessing procurement strategy and suppliers, or even dealing with uh, certain events such as delay in fabrication due to unexpected COVID outbreak, etc. Project, by definition, is to bring about changes to achieve planned objectives. In simple terms, Projects are risky. 
there are uncertainty uh, there are uncertainties that can affect the project's four pillars, namely the scope, cost, schedule, and quality. If I say project management is actually managing different weeks throughout the project life cycle, you may agree with me. This is the first lesson learned we would like to share with you. Project risk management is project management. They go hand in hand. It is actually an important mindset change. Yeah. Joshua? Yeah, yeah. Next, next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. The following chart is a typical risk process that many organizations use for managing risks. Firstly, identify the risk event on the left. And then we determine the likelihood and consequence of the risk, which is referring to the current status of the exposure and assign a current risk rating. And then we determine the treatment plan in the right hand side in order to reduce the risk to a certain level. This information is recorded in the risk register. And after a little while, every month or every quarter, we revisit the risk register to see if anything changed. Seems quite straightforward. However, we saw that there was a couple of things that we could improve. In our risk uplift program, we have introduced two additional steps and explicitly need the project team to perform. It makes the process more relevant to the underlying exposure with the decision making process. The first one, the first additional step is to perform a bow tie risk analysis. It identifies the root cause, impacts, possible control options. More detail will be shared in the next couple of slides under lesson two. And then we ask the team to set up a target risk rating before we determine and implement the treatment plan. Target risk rating represents the risk appetite of the company. It is so important to have a key view of the risk appetite of the project before selecting suitable treatment plan. With the target rating being set, Treatment plan is no longer just reduced, but we can also transfer, accept, and avoid the risk. More of those details will be shared in the next couple of slides under lesson three. Talking Jimmy. about yeah, talking about bow tie analysis. Has any has any of you used the bow tie, or whether you have uh, heard of this before? Bow tie is in fact widely adopted in some areas such as process safety. We found that bow tie analysis can be used effectively in projects to manage risk. This is the second lesson learned. Let me briefly introduce how bow tie works. For any project, once we have the project objectives identified, we can then determine what the key factor that is driving the project to achieve its objectives. For example, we can think about whether the project is schedule driven or cost driven at different stages of the project. Once we have identified the key driver, we then look into any risks that are likely to happen and impact the key driver. For example, if the key driver for the project during the execution phase is scheduled, that means the project has a critical scheduled deadline to meet. Any delay in the schedule can cause a huge impact to the project. Then we go deeper to identify any key risk events that will delay the project. In the bow tie, we put the identified key risk event at the center and look at its both sides. The left hand side of the bow tie is about the root causes and the associated preventive control measures for that risk event. While the white side is about the consequences and recovery measures for the risk. This bow ties analysis process helps us visualize and analyze the risk event from both the prevention and recovery. Once we have done the bow tie, we can assign the corresponding actions to relevant people, we call them action owners, and ensure that the measures and mitigations will be followed through. 
So the implementation of this bow tie analysis to the Hong Kong mega projects, we received some feedback from the project teams. Before that, when they were doing the bow tie, uh, when they were doing the risk analysis, they may just look at how to prevent the risk. But now the projects have benefited from a more complete recovery mitigations assessment as well, with better protections introduced when the risk event happens. One more thing, bowtie could also be used for opportunity analysis. It's about looking into the, into the causes impact and treatment options. We'll give more detail, details later. Next page, please. Okay. Um, as mentioned briefly, it's important to see, to set a clear target rating, to articulate what risk exposure that we are willing to take to achieve our objectives. Setting risk target rating is effectively a discussion of risk appetite. If risk appetite is not expressed explicitly, people make assumptions. And second guessing what the project owner or management want. And often people assume that management expect the project team to be conservative and minimize the risk as much as low as possible. When we are facing commercial risk, as low as possible may not be the best choice. Jimmy mentioned earlier about the APM definition of risk management. One of the same is to optimize success by minimizing threat and maximize opportunity and outcome. In many circumstances, resources are not unlimited. Taking a reasonable risk is necessary to achieve a better outcome for the project. Ultimately, it's a question on how to take a calculated risk on project planning and resources allocation under various constraints. As illustrated in the diagram on the right, the target rating is set at yellow, with the current rating at, at amber color. Now, when we set the target rating to yellow, the project team does not need to second guess what's the management one and reduce the risk rating all the way to green. If we do that, reducing the risk to green, it's going to consume a lot of resources for simply one risk. That is not the most efficient way. Now, when we are trying to set the target rating, there is actually just three possible outcomes. Ta target rating is lower than the current rating, target rating is equal to the current rating, or target rating is higher, higher than the current rating. For the first case, the treatment plan is to reduce the risk exposure by implementing various control. As the target rating is, is, is lower than the current. The second case, we, we accept the current level of risk exposure as because this is already equal to the current rating. However, we do need to monitor and spend effort to maintain the current level, not to move away from the current current standing. For the third case, target rating is higher than the current rating. It means that the current risk taking activities are not at its optimal form. Hence, the project team is expected to take some more risk. So we will talk about a bit more in the next two slides. Next page, please. Let's look at an example of what it means by taking more risk or risk-seeking decision. Now, in a construction project is required to go through ground investigation or survey prior to the construction. The question is whether the project should survey 50% of the area or just 10% of the area. Obviously, 50% of the area is a low risk option, but it will cost more time and resources. On contrary, 10% of the area survey is a high risk option. The question would be, what is the acceptable risk tolerance with the level of confidence that we are required? What are the trade-off optimal points between accuracy and uncertainty? If project team recommends the uncertainty of error, margin of error of 10% surveys, how much it will impact the cost and schedule or scope? It is important to perform quantitative cost, benefit, and risk analysis to support the recommendation. 
the analysis need to be transparent and be with open discussion with project owner or management. Ultimately, the project owner or management own the decision by approving the target rating and agree on the risk trade-off decision. Now, next page, please. Let's look at the dynamic nature of risk-taking decision. <clears throat> Any change of internal or external factor, we will have large impact on the cost project constraint as well as risk-taking decision. For example, so we use, so we order a new part or using a refurbished part for the project. Obviously, using refurbished part are a higher risk decision on performance. In in the situation of plentiful supply, it's an easy decision. When supply change is interrupted under COVID or under high geopolitical tension or heavy sanction environment, using a refurbished part for the project would seem to to be a better option, even with the high performance risk. Hence, the risk decision is not a one-off, done and dust. Constant reassessment of the current rating and target rating are important. When there is significant change in the operating environment, the risk rating will move. It may warrant a new set of risk assessment and reconsideration of treatment plan. So let's go back to the bow tie tool to revisit to revisit the situation and determine appropriate treatment option. Jimmy will share a bit more about the way we see treatment options. Thanks, Joshua. Jimmy, please. When it comes to defining the current and target risks, there are many factors to consider, such as the acceptance level of the risk, whether the mitigation measures can actually be carried out, and also the timeline of carrying out these actions. There are four different risk treatment options that we have identified. They are reduce, accept, transfer, and avoid. I'm going to give more details for each of them, and some examples will be followed. Reduce. We can try to reduce the likelihood of the risk. That means it's chance of happening, and or reducing the consequence, the impact. Accept. If there's not much we can do about the risk to reduce the likelihood or consequence, then we will just accept the risk. However, we do need to monitor and ensure current risk level will not decline further. Transfer. We can choose to transfer the risk to someone else or another party. The likelihood may be unchanged, but the consequence is reduced by shifting the risk to others. Avoid. If there are too many unknowns and the risk exposure is beyond our risk appetite, then we need to completely avoid it. Choose to exit completely. Here are some examples. For reduce, for example, when we are buying an equipment or a service, we can select a vendor with good credit and performance history to reduce the risk likelihood. We can also ask the vendor to provide bank guarantee to reduce the risk consequence. For transfer, many of us have experience in buying insurance. Buying insurance is actually transferring the risk to the insurance company. Of course, we need to pay the premium. Another example is that when we form a joint venture, with the partner, we, we are actually transferring part of the business risk to the partner. Accept, for example, we choose to accept the exchange rate variations with a pass-through arrangement. Finally, avoid. For example, we avoid the risk of working with a completely new supplier that is not known whether it is reliable or not. And Joshua will talk about uh, opportunities, yeah. Yeah, 
Thank you, Jamie. So with every risk come an opportunity. We need to take this into account as well. Mirroring the four risk treatment types of reduce, transfer, accept and avoid. Opportunity treatments include exploit, share, accept and enhance when the opportunity that come our way. Some organizations use value engineering to improve the value of a project. We consider value engineering is a subset under, um, under the umbrella of opportunity management. Now, so next, yeah. So what are the example of those four treatment options for opportunity? The first one, explore, we may want to increase the chance of increasing fund by constantly follow up stakeholder. Secondly, we can also share the opportunity benefit with other interest, interest party to increase the base of the opportunity or incentive. For example, bonus program with partners or with staff. Accept is basically not to introduce new treatment measure. We will see how the event will naturally go about on its own, and we choose to or have to accept it. For example, if a grant loan is the best option among many others, we may choose to accept it. Last, lastly is enhanced. Can we do something to make the opportunity better or even create the opportunity for the project itself? For example, we may be able to enhance the cost saving opportunity by renting out some idle resources. We often have a risk register for project risk man management, but do we have the opportunity register to monitor or follow up treatment plan for opportunity? That's something to think about. Talking about the fourth lesson learned, it is about enhancing project governance. Having done the risk and opportunity analysis using bow tie, we'll then get it reviewed or further input by some focus groups. The focus group is considered as an extension of the project team, with members from outside the project addressing other related issues such as contracts, overall company budgets, and the operation and maintenance. Usually, the focus group members are experienced subject matter experts in our concerns. The primary function of the focus group is to provide advice to the project in addressing a specific risk topic in an agile manner. The focus group allows us to get a deeper understanding of any possible extreme events before they happen. We have recently implemented this in the CLP's Hong Kong Mecca projects to enhance our risk management process. This is our fourth lesson learned. All right, uh, next page, please. Okay, now there are two types of environments that risk could manifest themselves. One is under everyday small condition. One is under extreme or wild conditions, such as COVID, large-scale international sanctions. They are low likelihood but high impact external events. Often when we consider risk, we often focusing on the mild condition, the left-hand side. This is natural. This is the familiar te territory. It's an easier type that we could imagine or could think about the scenario. For those rare or extreme effects on events are difficult to think of and often not to be considered. Unfortunately, history tells us that those extreme events are often the project or even the company killer. Apart from performing a set of bow tie analysis for the everyday risk, we also work with the project team on another set of bow tie analysis on extreme risk. It helps us to understand the impact of extreme events. The benefit of analyzing, analyzing, analyzing a wild condition extreme event is to ensure agility at all levels and eliminate the blind, blind spot. When we perform extreme event bow tie analysis, we ask ourselves four questions. First one, are we aware of all the complexity and interconnectedness? That is the relationship of the project and other part of the business. 
Second question is, are we resilient and flexible enough to handle threat and opportunity? So number three, what, what is the con continue, continuity plan? And number four, what can we do now or inference now? As we discuss under lesson two, there is two sides of the bow tie. The left hand side on the root cause and the right hand side on the consequence. The left hand side bow tie helps us to see how vulnerable we are. It helps us to identify the weakest link in advance. However, the most important value of the extreme risk bow tie came from the assessment of the right hand side on the consequence, which gave us insight on the type of recovery measure or project continuity plan need to be in place when the unexpected happen. We assess whether businesses have the ability to bounce back or the project able to resume back to the original plan when we are hit by an unknown extreme event for the project. For example, a major delay for the project for a year. All in all, it's about thinking ahead and be prepared for the unexpected. So in summary, our recent project risk management uplift had three main aspects which are vital to a successful risk management framework, including people, governance, and process. The five lessons learned through our enhancement include first, enhancing the culture. Second, using proper tools and concepts. Third, clearly identifying our risk appetite and target ratings. Fourth, enhancing the governance through focus groups. And finally, the fifth is analyzing extreme events. Yep. So for our enhancement, it moved the project risk management from a basic risk process to a more mature level and optimize our risk taking activities. It helped us to think of ways to prevent risk explore our opportunity and think about the continuity plan should any extreme event happens. All in all, risk management is an integral part of project management and will help us make better decisions for a successful projects. Now we see if there is any question for the presentation. Thank you, Joshua. I'll uh, I'll go through some of the questions, but just to remind everybody, put your you can enter your questions into the uh, the questions on the on the bar, and we'll have a uh, we'll have a look at it. Um, the first one is you mentioned there are four different treatment options for risks. Will you ever choose two treatment options at the same time, two or more? Yeah, maybe I take Jimmy. this question. Yeah, thank you for the question. This is a very good question. Um, we could have multiple treatments to handle the root cause and the consequence for the risk. Maybe I'll use a uh, everyday life example. Let's say driving a car. If the risk is um, lost control of a car, the bow tie analysis will tell us the root cause. That could be drunk, drunk driving or speeding. And the consequence could be financial loss for a write off of the car or injury. So in this example, to reduce the likelihood of the risk, the police may introduce drinking limit and speed limit and will do sport checks. The car company introduced the seat belt and airbag that will reduce the consequence of the risk. Whereas we, as users, we may buy the insurance to transfer the financial risk exposure to an insurance company. We could choose multiple treatment options at the same time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maybe the next question to maybe to Joshua. How do you see yeah. risk management evolving for projects in the future? Yep. Um that's a good question. I think it. That I see there is a three trends of um, development in the future. Now, this three trend is uh, having a balanced view with the risk and opportunity, 
And second one is uh, more move towards the quantitative risk analysis. And the third one is uh, using library of data. Now for the balance view of the risk opportunity, as we talked about earlier about the APM definition, it focusing on the both side, the um, reducing risk and optimizing the success or out outcome. So the balance view is quite important. Now the second point on the quantitative um, is uh, we will see a lot of uh, Monte Carlo simulations being used on the cost and schedule. Now, if I may go back again to the APM definition, risk is talking about allowing to see the individual risk and understanding overall risk. Now, overall risk is actually a component adding all the individual risk together to become an overall risk. By using Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo type of quantitative analysis is a powerful way to bring the two together. And the third one I mentioned earlier is about uh, using a library of data. So we can in see increasing use of, um, for example, reference cast forecasting. Um, it continues to co collect of the pro project data to build a bigger database, looking into the project outcome from the outside in rather than inside out. So it gives the ma management team more confidence on the evaluated project. So I think there's a, this three trend is evolving in the future. Okay, thank you, Joshua. And the next question is a bit of a practical one. Uh, can you ex share any example of a bow tie analysis, any spreadsheet? How exactly do you do it? So maybe some of the practicalities, and we've encountered this, right? Should you use software? Should you do it manually? What's, what's the, the best way to do it? Um, maybe yeah, I, maybe I, I, I can, yeah. Jimmy, yeah. you um, go ahead first. Yes, yeah. Uh, for the bow tie, um, it's either we can use a, just a simply uh, spreadsheet, uh, just uh, putting the uh, wood cost and also the uh, recovery yeah, on the both sides. Or with a more effective uh, tool, there are actually uh, some of the available software in the market. Uh, the one we are using uh, can uh, allow us to uh, input into the uh, system uh, and have a very immediate um, uh, vision. The visual effect is more uh, better. So if you need uh, more information, you can, uh, yeah, we can, I, I can provide you uh, more after the webinar, yeah. So I, I see bow tie itself is a way of thinking. Now the software, of course, able to help us to be more organized, but I think it's important to start with using the concept of looking at the risk event in the central and also the left-hand side of the root cause and the consequence. So um, yeah, it's important to get started to use it because once you're familiar with risk, um, it, it, it actually is a very powerful tool. Okay, good. Uh, the next one, which I think you covered a little bit already, but uh, maybe to, to cover it one more time, how can we determine which treatment option is to be adopted? What's, how, do we, how do we pick the best treatment option? Okay, yeah, maybe I, I, I take this question. Yeah. Uh, for at, uh, determining the treatment option, first, we should assess the current risk level and set the target waiting for it for the risk. We then ask ourselves, what is the available option to move from the current waiting to the target waiting? We may need to perform some kind of the uh, analysis that uh, Joshua mentioned earlier, such as the cost and benefit analysis on each of the option. And with that kind of the analysis done, we should be able to choose uh, uh, which treatment option is the best, like reduce, transfer, accept, or avoid? Yeah, then. Okay, good. Here's, a, uh, here's another very practical question, the process that you've gone through. Uh, how, is this, how is this different than a traditional kind of risk register that many projects use? 
maybe Joshua. Yes. So I think the traditional uh, risk process, I think um, that's focusing on the very individual risk. Very firstly, if we, we, we remember, we talk about two additional things that we add into the process. One is the bolt analysis. Um, the sec second one related to target risk rating. And both of them are actually help us to zoom out a bit to think about the bigger picture. So it actually adds value on why a helicopter view on what sort of thing we should focusing on. It's, it's, it's start to move away just looking at item individual by individual item. So give more confidence on we are understanding the bigger picture and how we actually looking at the overall impact on different driver of the project. Okay, good, thank you. Um, the next one, again, a very practical question. How can we better engage our contractors, subcontractors, or suppliers in, in this risk management process? For engaging the contractor, yes. If we, um, let's say, uh, when, when we are doing the project, so many times, the project team is not just uh, uh, a few people. Many times we engage the contractor to work together. Let's say in design, we will engage with the contractor to work together to come up with a better design. So if we are treating the contractor as part of the project team, it should be uh, easy as a project team to do the bow tie, to do the risk analysis together. Recently, we have updated the risk policy statement saying that responsibility of risk management is everyone in the organization, including employee as well as contractor. So it's actually important to involve everyone in the whole process here. Okay. Of course, uh, you. you can also say something in our contract with uh, the contractor, yeah, to put it as a requirement. Okay. All right. Uh, this this question, I think, is for both of you. Were there examples of projects you've been involved in where extreme events or black swan events have happened? And how did the early risk assessment benefit the team or not benefit it if it wasn't done? Maybe I start first. Um, so I think example in the past is preparation for the pandemics or COVID impact on the projects. Um, we assess the impact of the supply chains and availability of the key personnel for the project cycle. Um, most recent examples would be the extreme risk analysis on sanctions and what are the supply chains impact, impact or the payment system impact. We talk about the three system impact is quite a sens sensitive one. Um, do we provide training to our frontline staff, say, procurement team to understand the implication of sanction? Do we sign up a contract with some unknown color party? Do we have a mechanism to allow us to do the early detection? So all of this help us to be prepared, and ultimately this become a competitive advantage if we do it correctly. And I supplement something further. For extreme risk event, we put our focus on the consequence. No matter what kind of the reasons or root causes uh, lead to that extreme event, that means the extreme event will happen that time. So we put our focus on the consequence and think about the mitigations, how to minimize the impact to the project. For example, uh, in one of our recent um, project, uh, the battery port, uh, storage project, we identified the extreme risk event is delay the project for a year or increase the cost by 50% because, because there were many uncertainties that will lead to that kind of the extreme event happen. So, we discussed 
we involve the focus group and we uh, think about the mitigations, how to reduce the uh, consequence of this extreme event. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, based on this, this process, it seems that there could be a lot more risks to manage more things identified through this very comprehensive approach. How will you approach it with limited manpower in the project, as well as maybe some items being outside the remit of the project team, and maybe public affairs, or maybe government relations, or something else? How, how's, how, how should that be a, approached by the project team? Jimmy, you want to as go first? Look, yeah, as we look to uh, look at the, the polling result, yeah, most of the people think that the, the culture is important. So I would say in order to implement the risk management in a more in effective way, it needs the support from the management and the support from the whole organization. So if we have established the risk culture in the organization, then with limited resources, we can also engage suitable person, suitable people to perform a effective risk analysis. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think um, as the first lesson that we mentioned is about the mindset and the culture and how we see the importance of the risk management in the whole project management um, program is quite important. Um, and I think that's why when we try to introduce those additional steps on looking at the bigger picture and zoom out, it actually help us to focus on what is the most important thing to look at rather than just doing everything equally. So that actually improved the whole process by itself. Okay. Uh, here's a question on frequency, and it's related to how often should you do this bow tie assessment? And then how can a project practically keep the risk assessments up to date throughout the life cycle of the project? How, what's, the, what's the right frequency to do these, these different analysis? Okay. I think um, for the question of frequency on bow tie analysis or those risk analysis, we do not have a fixed answer. It really is depending on the complexity of the project and how often the internal and external factor changes. We do need to recognize, as I think we mentioned before, is BOTI is actually a way of thinking. And it helps us to break down the subcomponent of the risk treatment plan accordingly. So once we familiar with the methodology, it's very natural to think about using it for the risk and opportunity analysis. So doing bow ties, um, I think the important thing is to get started to do it once. And once we familiar with this, we, we will never get out of our mind. Um, it's very powerful tools. And I also say, as I mentioned earlier, uh, using the bow tie, we should have our project objective defined first. Whenever there are changes in the objectives, for example, say, when the project is moving from the development phase to the execution phase, the project objective may have changed. Then, in my opinion, we should have done the uh, bow tie analysis again. Yeah. Maybe I also supplement. Um, in the, um, when we first started, we asked the project team to do three, at least three bow ties. One bow tie is for the uh, project approval at the development phase of the project. And second one is doing a everyday risk analysis under the mild condition. And the third one, as we talk about fair bit, is the using the bow tie to do the extreme risk analysis. So, um, so these three is the basic requirement for every project from now on. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Uh, next question is, uh, you showed us the heat map with the, uh, with the events categorized. How, how, how do you normally categorize these very extreme 
or black swan events on the heat map? Or should you, or should you put it on the heat map? <laughs> it's a good question. So I think by definition, extreme event is a low likelihood and high impact event. Um, the challenge is if we have a couple of those things, it always gather on the top left hand side corner, which is the high impact and low likelihood. Now to differentiate um, what need to be addressed as a prioritization exercise, um, you could either in, either increase the in, increase the granularity say from the five to five for seven seven to seven hit, hit map, which is not going to be helpful. So I think there is better way to represent those information by using quantitative analysis or stochastic information to describe the, the actual chance of those uh, rare events happening and um, talking about the potential impact in, the, in, in possibly in financial terms. So those are more helpful, helpful ways to discuss with management on, the, on those uh, rare or black swan events. Okay, very good. So I think we're almost to the end of the time for our presentation today. Once again, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the uh, APM Greater Bay Area Branch, I would like to thank Joshua and Jimmy for the presentation on this very important topic of project risk management. Uh, there's been a few comments, uh, just as a reminder, you'll be able to find a recording of this presentation on the APM YouTube account and the slides will be published on the APM SlideShare account. Uh, but please give us about a week to get that done. Um, and I think, um, I, I, again, I'd like to thank you all for this presentation and uh, have, a, have a great day. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.